Welcome to Hope Unveiled, the podcast that guides you on a transformative journey toward a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ. We are Sunrise Church of Surrey, British Columbia, Canada, and our mission is to carry the hope and purpose of Jesus to those who may feel far from God. In each episode, we'll dive deep into the teachings of Jesus, offering practical insights and guidance for your faith journey. Whether you're taking your first steps in faith or seeking to deepen your existing relationship with Christ, we invite you to join us on this journey to embrace the hope that transforms lives. Can we please give a warm welcome to Pastor Mark Gordon. Good morning, Sunrise. So good to be with you again. I've been coming every month since January for a week. And uh, uh, today I'm going to share a message with you that's a two-parter. So that means you got to come back April 16th for the next part. How many like cliffhangers? You watch a TV show and it cliffhangs and then you got to wait till the next season to actually find out what happened. Anybody love that? No, not very much. But good news for you is you only got to wait a month. (laughs) <laughs> and if you miss that day, you can watch online later. It's okay. But it's a two-parter, and uh, I just want to share with you uh, for a few minutes, I just want to remind you that I wrote a book called Relationship Matters because I believe everything flows out of relationship. And, uh, and it's an essential uh, uh, blueprint to building strong families and fostering healthy relationships. And so um, I really believe that we have three primary relationships that God wants to heal. The first one's with himself, the second one's with ourselves, and the third one's with others. And if one of those is out of line, it affects the other ones, right? And so um, if you want one of those, you can come see me after. I'll be out in the foyer, and that's about uh, all I have to say about that. All right. How many feel like you're going in circles in your faith sometimes? Sometimes it feels like we're kind of, you know, all over the place, right? I I think of a a Ferris wheel when I think of uh, the journey of faith. Sometimes you feel like you're at the top, and it's amazing. But then you kind of start, and and then it moves around, and you feel like you're moving forward, and it's really good. But then we get back to the bottom, and then we kind of feel like we're going backwards, and then we're back to the top again. You know, the good news is it takes two mountain peaks for one valley. (laughs) That's good news, right? (laughs) So a lot of times in our journey, in our faith journey, we tend to go in circles. And sometimes it feels frustrating why we can't see this abundant life that Jesus has promised us. And so today I want to just talk about that a little bit. You see, most believers go in circles with their faith because they don't know their true identity or the authority that they have in Christ through that identity. Part of my journey was that discovery. This truth I'm going to teach you today changed my life significantly. See, before that, I was trying to be better, do better, and get better. In my healing journey, it was from addiction, and I, I, I uh, had a very strong addiction to alcohol and drugs and all the stuff that comes with it. And what happened was, is I was, when I first came to Christ, I thought that I needed to clean myself up before I could present myself to him. And then I discovered, actually, I don't need to. He already loved me. But then I couldn't, I had a disconnect, like I think a lot of us do, where I didn't actually... Um, experience some of the things I thought I would. You see, to live an abundant life Jesus has promised, we need a spirit life. To do this, we must understand the different functions between spirit, body, and soul. We are made up of spirit, soul, and body. And when Jesus redeemed me, my spirit was fully redeemed. It was beautiful. You remember that first love? Remember when you first came to Jesus? Man, It was just like, mind blown. But then we start on our little faith journey. And how many have had any struggles in life? (laughs) How many have gone through betrayal, harm, trauma, hurts? You see, I didn't go into addiction just because I felt like it. I went into addiction because I was trying to medicate my hurts, 
my pain, my trauma from my childhood. And so what happened was, is when I did that, I was trying to do it kind of in a soul power. So today I want to talk about this battle that's within each of us. And I hope by the end of it, I'm going to actually pray for you that God is going to open a valve in your life that releases the spirit life from you. Amen? Amen. Genesis 2.7 says this, Then the Lord God formed man of the dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. That word breath of life in the Hebrew is spirit. Literally, God breathed his spirit into Adam, which made him come alive, be living. Isn't that amazing? Folks, you have the breath of God living in you. You have the breath of God living in you. It's amazing. James 2, 26 says, For just as the body without the spirit is dead, so also faith without works is dead. You see, it's comparing there. When we don't live out the life of the Spirit in our lives, our faith kind of dies, doesn't it? And part of this reason is because we're in this battle between our soul and our flesh and and our spirit, and we don't know exactly why all of that is taking place. And I'm going to try and be as succinct as I can today to give you some tools on how to overcome this problem. 1 Thessalonians 5.23 says, Now may the God of peace make you holy in every way and make your spirit, your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless until our Lord Jesus comes again. That word holy means to be set apart. He has set your whole being apart, but it identifies the three different parts of your body, of your life. It's your spirit, soul, and body. Now, I want to just throw a chart up here on the screen, and and it'll help you understand what I'm saying. You see, at the core of who we are and our identity, it's our spirit, and then our soul, and then our body. Now, Now, I want to just be clear on this. The spirit is the part that you can't see or feel. The soul is the part that you can't see, but you can feel. And the body is the part you can see and feel. Make sense? Pretty simple, right? I want you to note there that the soul touches both the spirit and the body. In fact, the spirit only reaches the body through the soul. This is going to become important in a few minutes. The power of agreement is that majority wins. So when your soul aligns with your spirit then you have a two against one situation and majority wins. You see, in the church world, we're too sin conscious. We're so sin conscious that we are trying to do things to make ourselves better. What I'm trying to say is we need to be Christ conscious. We need to be focused on Jesus, not what we mess up on, (laughs) right? I don't know why it got this way, But the church somehow has come into this place where we talk about do's and don'ts instead of yeses and no's. Yes to what Jesus, the spirit life-giving life of Jesus in us, and no to what would keep us from seeing that alive in our life. Amen? So as you can see here, there's a tug-of-war going on. Andrew Womack said, many people don't recognize the fact that their spirit is the core of who they are. They function primarily out of the soulish realm, believing what they think and feel is reality. They may perceive their souls to be the core of who they are, but God's word says differently. Isn't that true? You see, here's the problem. Because we feel our soul, because it's our mind, it's our thoughts, it's our experiences, it's, it's the, you know, in my trauma, depression, discouragement, all of that, we think that that's who we are. In fact, we've even heard it said, probably, that, you know, your soul is your personality. Can I suggest to you that the center of who you are is your spirit? It's your spirit. And that's where Jesus lives. Do you know when he redeemed you? He redeemed you back to pre-fall status. But in other words, before Adam ever took part in that first fruit and was separated from God, 
When you come to Christ, your spirit is fully a resident of heaven. It fully lives with Jesus and Jesus with you. There is no separation. In fact, Romans 8 says there, nothing can separate you from the love of God. Nothing can separate you or pull you apart from that. The problem is this. There's this little graph that I actually saw that Andrew Weck provided, and I just thought it was really good. On the one side is our spirit. That's at the core of who we are. And in the middle is our soul, is our mind, our, you know, our, our will, our emotions. And there's a valve that's in our soul. And then there's our body on the other side. And if you can picture this with me, what happens in life, I believe, is that we focus on what we can see instead of what we don't see. We focus on the emotions and the things that we experience in life rather than on the things that Jesus says and who he says we are. You see, if we know our identity in Christ, when we know who he says we are, that we're more than conquerors, that we can do immeasurably more than we could hope or imagine, when we understand he called you a masterpiece, when you understand that, what happens is your spirit begins to rise up and it opens the valve and it impacts your soul, which then your body just responds to. Why do we go through struggles of temptation in our flesh? I thought we were saved. I thought that we were, you know, now new creations, that our sinful nature was torn away. Why do I still have these temptations and these lusts of my flesh? I will tell you this, that if we focused on the Spirit of God and His Word, what He says, and allow the Spirit to rise up in us, then our soul will come into line. And then our body will crave what the Spirit wants us to crave. I'm going to give you some scripture around this. John 7, 38 says, Anyone who believes in me may come and drink, for the scriptures declare rivers of living water will flow from his heart. Amen? Notice it doesn't say anyone who has a soul, who feels hurt, who feels pain, who, who feels betrayal, who, who tries harder, who thinks that they have to do better. No, it says anyone who believes may come and drink. You see, it's belief. Can I suggest today we don't just need faith in Jesus, we need the faith of Jesus manifesting in our lives. That's where the Spirit lives. Amen? Galatians 5, 16 and 18 says, So I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives, then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. You see, if the Spirit's in charge, our cravings change. When the Spirit's in charge, our soul will come underneath the authority of our spirit, then we will have our body follow suit. Our flesh, our desires, if you will. Verse 17 says, the sinful nature wants to do evil, which is the opposite of what the Spirit wants. And the Spirit gives us desires that are opposite to what the sinful nature desires. These two forces are constantly fighting with each other, so you are not free to carry out your good intentions. Which highway is paved with good intentions? <laughs> if you've heard that expression, it's the highway to hell is paved with good intentions. You see, our sinful nature wants to do what it wants to do, but it's taking its cues from our soul. But your spirit is fully redeemed. And if we can train our soul to take direction from our spirit, we never need to worry about the temptation again. That's why I don't focus on what's wrong. I focus on what's strong. Amen? Verse 18 says, but when you are directed by the spirit, you are not under obligation to the law of Moses. What does that mean? Jesus fulfilled the law. So we don't have some moral ascent to climb a mountain to. We already have Jesus' righteousness living in us. We already have his spirit. And when his spirit leads us, we're not under obligation to the law because we're not going to desire the things that would be offensive to the law. We're actually going to live out the very law itself. Does that make sense? Galatians 5, and 3 says, but the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against these things. 
I want to point out a couple of things. It says the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit. It's singular fruit. He produces those kinds of fruit in your life. I just want to say something here. Your emotions, your soul wants to feel it, wants to touch it, wants to feel it in some way. Can I just say to you, just because you may not in your soul feel love, feel joy, feel peace, feel patience, it does not mean that you don't possess it. It's just living in your spirit, and you need to open the valve so that it can come and flood your soul. Amen? That's, that's the beauty is that you already possess these things. You already possess this fruit because Jesus lives in you. Stop trying to be better, do better, and just allow, open the valve, let Jesus flow through you. And you're going to see more love. You're going to see more. You'll experience love and joy and all those things. But they are there whether you do or you don't. So what do you believe? Listen, even when we come into these settings, and worship was amazing today, and, and we feel, anybody feel his presence? Yeah. Do you know that his presence didn't come from outside of you? It was the rivers of living water rising up in you. Because our spirits joined with his spirit in worshiping the Father. Oh, that's why you all of a sudden feel his presence. But his presence was in you whether you felt him or not. He's there, and you can access him anytime. You can call him up by opening that valve and starting to worship him and praise him and, and, and believe him, and all of a sudden you'll start to see your mind shift. You'll start to see, think differently. You'll start to see things differently, and you'll start operating in a faith that will open that valve in your neighborhood, in your friendships, in your life. We had a young man, a youth ministry, years ago we, we led... We had 10% of the youth population in this city that we lived in come to Christ. Amazing move of the Spirit. And this young man was saved one week, and he came into a prayer meeting we were having the week after, and uh, he'd been kind of hanging around for a while and before he gave his heart to the Lord, but he actually had just asked a question when we were praying. He says, I've been reading the New Testament in that book. Uh, starts with an A. I said, Acts? Yeah, that's it. And he said, um, I, I, I believe it, but why don't I see it? And I said, well, that's a good question. Why don't we put it? This, this was a youth church, and it was for youth by youth. They led worship. They did the drama. They did the preaching. They did everything. We just stood back and let God do what he does through young people. Loved it. But he said that, and I said, isn't that interesting? That's a very good question. Maybe it's because... We don't believe it. Maybe because we don't believe it. You see, the valve is belief. And he said, well, how do you open that? And I said, you just believe. You just step into it. Okay. That night, he prayed for a 16-year-old girl that had cervical cancer. We all knew about it. We had all been walking with her in this. That young man, saved for more, just over a week, prayed for her, and she was completely healed, doctor verified, completely set free. Because he was just young enough, foolish enough, not discipled enough to believe what the Bible said. Galatians 5, 24 and 5 says, those who belong to Christ Jesus have nailed the passions and desires of their sinful nature to his cross and crucified them there. I think too often our soul wants to nail our troubles to our cross. But this says, no, we, we nail that sinful nature to his cross and crucified them there. And since we are living by the Spirit, let us follow the Spirit's leading in every part of our lives. That's soul and body too. Your soul and your body can follow the leading of the Spirit. Amen? Why don't we see it? Why don't we see it? Well, I have a little graph here. that I want to go through a few little graphs here that I saw and I thought was really good. 
God's design was that our spirit would rule over our soul and then the body falls in line. So our spirit rules over our soul, then our body will follow in line. So the spirit is our true identity. That's our true core. That's where God's kingdom lives. Our soul is our self-identity. That's our will and emotions, our experiences in life, our trauma. That's where our, that's where our self-identity, our soul realm comes from. And then our body is our sin identity, right? Our sinful nature. It kind of craves what it craves until Jesus comes in and rips it from us, right? Here's the problem. The sin of the first Adam set in motion a tug-of-war between the spirit and the flesh, or the body. So the soul is set in the middle, and if you can picture the three circles beside each other, it's pulling against the soul all the time. It's always this tension between what my body craves or what my flesh craves, if you will, that sinful nature that doesn't even part of me anymore, but seems to still call me, right? And my spirit who is calling me towards Christ and towards Jesus. And when you look at that tug of war, that's what we're feeling. So what happened was, is in other words, Adam's sin turned God's plan upside down, where the body or the sinful nature ruled over the soul, our will, emotions, and mind, and then our spirit was dead. Now, it was still in seed form in us. When I was in my addiction, there was many times that I would actually uh, hit, like there was one time particularly I was overdosing, and I figured I was going to die. And in that moment, because I was raised in the church, in that moment, I cried out to God. I didn't cry out to anyone else. <laughs> they all abandoned me. They thought I was going to kick, and they didn't want to be around when I died. But I called out to Jesus, and in that moment, I instantly got sober. Now, I'd love to tell you that was the end of my addiction, and I served the Lord the rest of my days, but not yet. <laughs> not then. But it did impact me deeply. You see, something rose up in my spirit that called my soul to attention and called my body into alignment. And that drug left my body because Christ took over in that moment. You see, you have resurrection power living in you, but you can't access it because you're only trusting what you can see, touch, and feel. In other words, Adam's sin turned it upside down. But when we go to the next slide, the gift of the second Adam is that Jesus reset the original plan of God. So now our spirit rules over our soul, which rules over our body. When the, your soul comes into agreement with your spirit, resurrection power is released. That's the valve. And that's an abundant life follows. Amen? This is exactly where the church is weak because we operate in soul power instead of spirit power. We're trying to fix things through soul power instead of allowing the spirit of Christ to rise up. When we're making decisions, we try to depend on our, our reasoning and our, in our mind, right? Our souls, our brain. We're trying to reason things out. No, come Holy Spirit. He changes everything. I always say, change your mind, you'll change your life. Let the Spirit of Christ in you rise up with that rivers of living water so that he can renew your mind. And have you ever noticed when that happens? Have you ever noticed when you're in a worship setting, when you're feeling the river flowing inside you, your thinking changes? Hope rises up. Faith rises up. You start, to, you start to believe. You start to feel valued. You start to feel like you could conquer the world. Vision starts dropping into your heart. Ideas come to you on how you can start to reach to your neighbors and whatnot. Listen, I, I love revival. And hear what I'm not saying, but we don't need revival. We need a harvest. We need a harvest in this hour. And how is that harvest going to come if we keep looking for a revival that's just out of reach? Listen, Jesus lives in you. The revival's already come. Let it rise up. Let it rise up through you and start to let his life flow from your life. And you will see a harvest come to your life. Amen? I should start preaching soon. 
John 14, 23 and 4 says, Jesus replied, all who love me will do what I say. My Father will love them, and we will come and make our home with each of them. Anyone who doesn't love me will not obey me. And remember, my words are not my own. What I am telling you is, coming, is from the Father who sent me. He has made a home in you, but he is in your spirit. Because he's a holy God, he will not reside in an unholy place. So he had to make you holy before he could reside in you. And that's why your spirit is fully and utterly redeemed. There is no leaven in your, the bread of your spirit. <laughs> but in your soul, there's a little leaven. But Jesus has come that you might have life and have it abundantly. And you have everything you need in him. Ephesians 1, 18, 20 says, I pray that your hearts will be flooded with light so that you can understand the confident hope he has given to those he called. Remember the first week I was here, I talked about god confidence and how when our confidence is in God, that we have great confidence. Something rises up inside us. That's that confident hope. He has given to us he, those he's called, his holy people who are his rich and glorious inheritance. I also pray that you will understand the incredible greatness of God's power for us who believe him. Didn't just say believe in him, believe him. What he says about you, what he has said, you are more than a conqueror. You are a masterpiece. When you believe him, it changes your life. And the greatness of his power is released from your life. This is the same mighty power in verse 20 that raised Christ from the dead and seated him in the place of honor at God's right hand in the heavenly realms. Anytime you see right hand in the Bible, it means authority. So he has raised Christ from the dead and seated him in heavenly places. Another part of the word tells us that we're seated with him in those heavenly places. So we have his authority. Ephesians 1 says we have every spiritual blessing that's available in heaven is available to us. It's living in you. You don't have to apprehend it some, from somewhere far out. He is living in you. Just release it from your spirit. Release healing from your spirit. Release wholeness from your spirit. Release shame from your soul. Tell it to get out. It doesn't belong in you because your soul belongs to Jesus. He paid the price for it. It says, God's right hand in the heavenly realms. Your spirit lives there. Your soul and your body don't, but will respond to it when you believe. Belief is the valve that opens that up. When you believe and you realize that your spirit's living in heavenly realms right now. Do you know what's in heaven? We heard it earlier from Andrea. There's no sorrow. There's no pain. We sang that song this morning. There's no pain. There's no sorrow. When we, that's where I want to live. We keep talking about going to heaven one day. People, Sunrise Church, heaven's in you. Yeah. Heaven's in you. Why don't I see it? Why? We got to open the valve so we can see it more. We believe so we see instead of seeing to believe. We need to believe and then you'll see. I would say, don't fake it till you make it. Declare it until you believe it. And then believe it until you know it. And then know it until you practice it. Amen? That's the progression. More on that on April 16th. Okay. <laughs> Little teaser there. Colossians 2, 8, and 10 says, Don't let anyone capture you with empty philosophies and high-sounding nonsense that comes from human thinking and from the spiritual powers of this world rather than from Christ. For in Christ lives all the fullness of God in a human body. i got to pause there. The fullness of God, all that he is and who he is, his character, nature, love, everything we could possibly want, lives all the fullness of God in a human body. It's speaking of Jesus, but it's also speaking of us. Because Christ lives in us. And because we're in Christ, we have the fullness of all that God is living in us. No longer 
are you subject to this world's pain? No longer are you subject. Now, we still experience, we, yes, we can't escape. We're still here on earth. We have a body and a soul to manage. But when you let the Spirit rule, when you live by the Spirit, and you live a Spirit life, oh, it gets fun. And yes, I use the word fun. It gets fun. I remember one time, I'll, I'll close with this story, maybe. Um, but uh, I remember one time I was, we had a fire uh, many years ago, several years ago, and we ended up uh, losing our house in the fire, and so we lost everything, and so we were living uh, in somebody else's basement, and we didn't have laundry facilities, so my wife mentioned one day she was tired of doing laundry at the laundromat, so my daughter and I thought, well, we'll, bless her, let's go do the laundry. So we're on the way to do the laundry, and I get a call from her, and she's my wife, and she's saying, Mark, you got to get over here right now. There's a lady. She's just freaking out. She's having a real struggle. Uh, something's going on. I think it's demonic. I don't know how to explain it, but you got to get over here. And so we just pulled into the laundromat, and I noticed a lady screaming into a phone in front of the hairdresser next door. And I said, wow, this is some day. I said, I've got one here where I am. And she said, I said, where are you? And she said, I'm at the, I'm at the hairdresser next to the laundromat. <laughs> I said, oh, I said, well, I'm right here. And she says, what are you doing here? And I, said, I said, I'll tell you later. So I get out of the car and I go and talk to this young lady and she is distraught. And I, I, I don't have time to tell you the whole story, but bottom line is a guy, somebody walked into the, her store. She worked in the hearing aid place next door to the hairdresser. And this guy came in and he was under, I believe now, under a demonic uh, spirit of some sort, and he started cursing her and calling and throwing things, and then she said things were flying off her desk without anybody touching them, and it was like just a really demonic thing, and she said she felt fear at her core. But anyway, when I got there, she's like hyperventilating, and I just sat down, I said, there was a little table outside the hairdresser, and you know, it was a funny scene driving up because all these ladies are out with their, you know, things and hair all and and whatever and they're all trying to comfort her and she's just not comfort you know there's no consoling so i just came in and i let the spirit of christ in me i prayed as i was walking up and i was just praying under my breath and in in, in my heavenly language and i was just and I, I just lord you gotta and i just sat down and instantly i felt i said take my hands and she took my hands and i just said i'm a follower of jesus the bible says that he is the prince of peace May I pray for peace for you? She said, yeah, yes, please. And I prayed with her, and instantly peace came over her and calm came over her. And she took a big breath in. Funny story, by the way, as I was starting, a lady walked out of the shop and said, oh, I practice Reiki, I can help. And I said, and I said, I said excuse me, ma'am, I said, I'm a bearer of light, I've got this handle. And she said, oh, good, you're doing a good job. <laughs> <laughs> well, I am a bearer of light. So anyway, so I ended up, so I ended up praying for this girl. And long story short, uh, she felt the peace of God. We went into the shop. She was scared to go back into her shop. And there was definitely an evil presence there. And I just prayed through the shop. And we, bingo, there was just like peace in there. And she felt it. Just as we we're finishing up, her parents come in. And they're freaking out. Like, who are these people? And what are they doing to you? And it's like, and she's, no, Dad. She says, he prayed for me, and I feel peace, and, you know, whatever. And she explained the story to him and what happened, and, and he, they thanked me. And I guess as they were leaving, I didn't know this till later, as they were leaving, they got a call, and her grandma was rushed to the hospital because she fell ill. She was in a nursing home, but she was, and they didn't think she was going to make it. So they rush over to see grandma. About a week later, whatever, I stopped by the shop just to see how she was doing, and she said, oh, I'm so glad you came in. i got to tell you this story. And I said, what? She said, right as we were leaving, the hospital called. My grandma was taken to the hospital. The nursing home called, and they were taken to the hospital. And they didn't think she was going to live. And she said, I got into the room, and I remembered that you said Jesus was the Prince of Peace. And I thought to myself, I should ask for peace. And so she said, she said I prayed, I think, over Grandma, and I said, Prince of Peace, come and help Grandma like you helped me. And she was completely healed. Wow. 
she said, she said, I just, I just, you know, didn't know what to do. But you see, when she was with us and she received Jesus, she now had resurrection power living in her. She didn't have to go through a course and a discipleship process and all those things to be able to exercise the spirit of life that was in her. Why do us, who have been following the Lord for 30 years, have to go through a process to see that happen? Just believe, folks. Just believe. Release faith. It goes on to say, For in Christ lives all the fullness of God in human body, so you also are complete through your union with Christ, you who is the head over every ruler and authority. Isn't that amazing? You're complete. I want you to look at your neighbor and say, you're complete. You are complete. Listen, I know some days it doesn't feel like we're complete. I know some days there's pain in the offering of living in this world and that maybe you don't feel complete every moment. But I'm here to declare over you, you are complete because you have the living God living in you. Colossians 2, 12, 11, 12, I'm almost done. When you came to Christ, you were circumcised, but not from a physical procedure. Christ performed a spiritual circumcision, the cutting away of your own sinful nature. For you were buried with Christ when you were baptized, and with him you are raised to life. If you have not gone through baptism, Easter weekend, you can get baptized. Let Pastor Braden know. All right, put your hand up, Pastor Braden, so everybody knows. Yes. All right. For you were buried with Christ when you were baptized, and with him you were, listen to this, and with him you were raised to a new life because you trusted the mighty power of God who raised Christ from the dead. How many trust the mighty power? You see, it didn't say here uh, that you see it, you feel it, you touch it. It said that you believed and trusted in it. Listen, there's lots of days we don't feel Jesus, but he is there. He is there because his word says he is. Because you believed in your heart and you confessed with your mouth, you are saved. Amen? Amen. Colossians 2.23, 20, you have died with Christ and he has set you free from the spiritual powers of this world. You are set free. I declare it over you. You are set free. So why do you keep following the rules of this world as in don't touch, don't taste, don't, uh, don't, sorry, don't handle, don't taste, don't touch. Such rules are me mere human teachings about things that deteriorate us, uh, deteriorate as we use them. These rules may seem wise because they are required strong devotion, pious self-denial, and severe bodily discipline. I failed already, okay? I could never live up to that. But they provide no help in conquering the person's evil desires. Colossians 3, 1 and 4 says, Since you have been raised to new life with Christ, set your sights on the realities of heaven, where Christ sits in the place of honor at God's right hand. Think about the things of heaven. That's your spirit. Kingdom thinking not the things of earth. That's your carnal thinking. That's your soul thinking. How many times do we fight over things of earth when we have unity in Jesus? We have unity in Christ. We don't see it because we don't have that spirit life living. Verse 3 says, For you died to this life, that's the carnal life, and your real life, that's the spirit life, is hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is your life, is revealed to the whole world, you will share in all his glory. I got to share in his glory by sharing his peace with that young lady. And she got to share the peace that she received with her grandma. See how it works? Folks, this next revival, this next move of God, the harvest, is not going to be from a stage it's going to be from your heart. I'm just going to say that. It's not going to be because of somebody's a great preacher or because somebody is a great, we have a great band or any of those things. It's going to be because we turn the valve on to allow our spirits to flow into our lives and flood our souls. Amen? 
Colossians 3, 12 and 13, Since God chose you to be holy people he loves, you must clothe yourselves with tender-hearted mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Make allowance for each other's faults and forgive anyone who offends you. Remember the Lord gave, forgave you, so you must forgive others. It's kind of funny, that's right in the end of my message, but it's because when we try to figure things out carnally or in our souls, we're just going to get offended again. But when we allow the Spirit of Christ to rise up, we forgive. We're not offended. I tell people, you can't offend me. Well, what if I said this to you? No, you can't offend me because I choose to be offended or not. And my spirit rules in my life. Christ's spirit rules in my life. So above all, verse 14 and 15, above all, clothe yourselves with love which binds us together in perfect harmony and let the peace that comes from Christ rule in your hearts. For as members of one body, you are called to live in peace and always be thankful. Isn't that an amazing promise? I have a little saying, total surrender, total victory. Total surrender, total victory. Let your spirit rule over your soul, which will rule over your body. And a lot of hardships will go away. Doesn't mean that we still don't have struggles. There's still that tug of war on. But at any time, in any moment, you can just stop and say, Jesus, I open the valve to you. Would you flood my soul? Would you flood my body? Rise up. He's there whether you feel him or not. He's with you. He will never leave you. He'll never forsake you. He's with you fully. Amen? Amen. Amen. I'm going to ask the team to come up. And I just want to do something here. And then we're going to have prayer on both sides. And if you need prayer, you are welcome to get prayer. But the Lord asked me to do something today. Now, I don't feel anything. Okay? Okay. But I know that he spoke it into my spirit that I'm going to open a valve over Sunrise Church today. Now, I'm very grateful that Sunrise Church is spirit-led. Don't hear what I'm not saying. I'm just saying that it's not the corporate uh, organization that is anointed. It's the church. It's the people. Yes, there's organization that needs to happen when you gather a bunch of church people. You are the church. It's not this building. And I really believe that we've got to stop looking to the leaders and the platform for our guidance and start looking to the Spirit of God. If, listen, if I wasn't full of the Spirit of God today and anointed, you just wasted your time. But the reason this message is resonating with you is not because I'm an expert expository, or whatever that word is. See, I can't even say it. I'm so bad at it. It's because the life of Christ is in me, and he's been flowing in you. And we have connection in the spirit. We have connection in the spirit. You're witnessing with this word because you have connection in the spirit. And so all I'm going to do is come into agreement with, with what Jesus has already done. I want you to understand that. Just because we do these things doesn't mean that they weren't already there. I'm just opening up what's already in you, okay? I'm declaring what I already see Jesus has done at Sunrise Church. So, if you have been struggling with this tug of war that I talked about today, where you are not feeling the Spirit of God rising up and, and you're not experiencing his love and his joy and his peace and your soul and body have been kind of taken over. They've, they've ganged up to, 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 you know, to try and pull you down. I want you to stand up and I'm going to make a declaration over you today. Just stand where you are. I'm not going to do anything further than that. Other than after, you're welcome to come up for prayer if you have some specific things you need prayer for. But if you've been feeling that tug of the flesh, that tug of your soul that is taking you away from believing and from the faith that God has planted in you, then you can stand. And I'm going to pray over you. And I'm praying over sunrise. And I'm praying over whoever watches online. And we're just going to trust the Lord that he's going to do the work that I declare. Amen? So Jesus, we thank you first and foremost that you came and you defeated death. You set our souls free because you defeated the death that was so urgently trying to take our souls out. But Jesus, 
You were raised from the dead. You defeated that death through resurrection power. It was your spirit rising up that defeated death. It wasn't human effort. It wasn't soul power. So right now, in the name of of Jesus. I declare and I open the valve at Sunrise Church. I open the valve over the people who call this home, over this, uh, whoever's online and here in this room who stood up and said, I want Jesus' spirit to live fully in my life. Lord, I open the valve. We open it prophetically right now. We just open that valve. The greater understanding, greater revelations coming forth in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Your spirit will rule over the souls of this house in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, we just thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Holy, holy are you. <laughs> just begin to thank him. Thank you, Jesus. Rise up, Spirit of God, in me. <laughs> Rise up. What is it now? Even think of earlier when we were praying for healing. We just open the valve. You just open the valve and his spirit will flood in. And your body has to come in line with what God's will is. What his desire is. What his word says. Lord, I speak alignment over the people. That their spirit would rule over their soul, which would rule over their bodies. And Lord, we release your health. We release them from shame. We release them from all those things that were cluttering up their soul. We just ask your spirit to come and bring full healing and completeness in them. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for listening to Hope Unveiled. If you're interested in learning more about what you heard today, or if you would like us to pray for something specific for you, we invite you to connect with us on our website, sunrise.ca.